It was a beautiful sunny day with a light breeze in Tallahassee, Florida. It was a Saturday 22nd of October 1966 and the Seminoles was playing Mississippi State football team which was a huge deal for Tallahassee and everybody would be going. Tallahassee itself was a fast growing town but it didn't lose its innocent small town lifestyle. Muriel Court was a great example of that as generations of kids grew up and played together and stayed in touch for years. One family who lived in 641 Muriel Court, the Sims, who were originally from Meridian in Mississippi, were also a big part of that community. Dr. Robert Sims, 42, worked in the Department of Education in IT. He was one of the first people to work in the computer division and was a very respected man in this field of work and the community. His wife Helen, 34, was a church secretary for the First Baptist Church. They had three daughters, Jenny, 17, Judy, 16, and Joy, who was the youngest, age 12. All the girls were described as a lovely, polite, intelligent girls. One source described them as an all-American family. In the evening, the two oldest sisters, Jenny and Judy, were babysitting and Robert, Helen and Joy stayed at home. At around 11, when the football game had finished, Jenny came home and found the house quiet, with the TV still on. She looked for them room to room until she went to the master bedroom and discovered her mum, dad and sister. Her mum had been stabbed, shot and was laying halfway across the room. Helen at this time was still breathing. Her father, Robert, was still breathing but, and died not long after. He had been bound and shot on his bed. Joy was dead. She had been stabbed seven times. She also had her underpants pulled down to her ankles. At the time, there wasn't an ambulance service, so all Judy knew was to do was call the local funeral home and ask for help. Mr. Russell Beavis and his son Rocky answered the call and rushed over. The minute they turned up, they knew instantly to call the sheriff's department, who at the time, Larry Campbell, the deputy sheriff, was to attend, while Mr. Beavis and his son made sure they didn't disturb anything in the house. As this had never happened before in Tallahassee, there was an air of nervous excitement and curiosity. One source said that whilst waiting for Larry Campbell to arrive, the crime scene had been contaminated through neighbours walking in and having a look and also taking items, one of which was an ashtray. The investigators interviewed neighbours, but to no avail. This left residents terrified and wanting answers. Halloween was cancelled as a precaution and gun sales went up almost instantly. People became wary of others around them, wondering who it could be. As investigations continued, police started to look at the pastor of the First Baptist Church, a Dr. C.A. Roberts. The reason for this was because of what was said during these investigations about his behaviour, which brought up a red flag, such as women having problems with him, including Mrs. Sims, who days earlier before her murder had resigned from her job as a church secretary though the reason for this is unknown as to why. It was said that he had had many, many affairs with women and that when it came to light that he was looked at as a personal interest. Women that had affairs with him who felt paranoid phoned the police department to say they had nothing to do with the murder. There was absolutely no evidence found of Mrs Sims having an affair with the pastor, but it might have been the case that she knew too much. However, Pastor Roberts said, he was at the game that night and there was actually visual foot video footage of this that proved this. Although there was a small gap of time in the footage where the pastor had disappeared, the sheriff's department proved that this was not enough time to travel to Muriel Court to commit the murder and come back in time for the second half of the game. So the pastor was finally eliminated from the case. In the 1970s, a suspect cropped up. That was 29-year-old Tommy Fulgham who in 1978 had brutally killed his girlfriend in his apartment in Atlanta. Police had found her hands had been chopped off and her liver in a jar. Tommy had been obsessed with religion and believed he might have been the devil. After investigators had done some research, they found that Tommy was from Tallahassee and lived two blocks away from Muriel Court and was 16 years old at the time of the killings. Sources say that he was a normal kid growing up and was quite a small in stature. He had served in the Navy, but was honourably discharged. His mental health had declined rapidly in the 1970s. 
It was noted in the 1966 investigations that when the police were interviewing neighbours, they had gone to Tommy's parents' house and he was absent from the residence. As it turned out, after the other people who were connected to Tommy at the time said he was actually seen at a party, the Sims had been killed. So initially, he looked like he could have been the guy, as living so close to the Sims, and the fact that he had killed his girlfriend. But after his fingerprints were taken, Tommy Fulgums were not a match. Years later, in the 1980s, a third suspect was produced, a Robert Howells. This was from a letter that his ex-wife Peggy had written, which had been found by someone in the 1980s. And in the letter, details of Robert Howells and his mistreatment of Peggy, stating he was a violent drunk and on that day, after his wedding, which was the 21st of December 1966, told his new wife in detail that he had committed the murders. The supposed motive was that Mr Howells had a disagreement with Helen Sims in a grocery shop in town and basically vowed to kill her. Police contacted Peggy, wanting her to go undercover to try and get a confession out of him. It didn't work, as somehow Robert's daughter found out and tipped him off. Anyway, Robert Howells passed the polygraph test and his fingerprints did not match the ones found at the crime scene. Also, a gun Robert Howells owned back in the 60s, which was a 32 caliber, was different to the one used to kill the Sims family, which was a 38 caliber. Nobody knew why Peggy wanted to implicate her ex-husband, but one theory was that when he said her what he said to her the day after the wedding was something that was commonly used by other abusive men in the area to keep their wives in line. Lastly, in 1987, the Tallahassee Sheriff, Larry Campbell, gets a call from Mary Charles LeJoy Fox. She had seen an article of the 1966 crime and thought she would get arrested. Back then, she was Mary Charles LeJoy, who lived near Muriel Court with her parents and was dating Vernon Fox, whose parents' backyard backed onto the Sims property. Both Mary, Charles and Vernon's parents disapproved of their relationship. Both had dysfunctional families. Mary did not get along with her adopted parents, and Vernon, Vernon's father openly had affairs with other women and was a drinker, which caused a rift and tension within the home. Mary had met Vernon through being friends with his sister, but in general, she was quite lonely came across as a very strange person who was obsessed with death and had been caught, been caught it breaking into funeral homes and slept in there, also taking objects to satisfy her obsession with death. Mary Charles told police in a six-hour interview that back on October the 15th, 1966, Vernon had been seen peeping on 12-year-old Joy Sims. Now at the time, there had been reports of a prowler, which happened to stop when Vernon had joined the military. When Vernon had been caught peeping at Joy, this worried Mary at the time as she didn't want Vernon to get into trouble and then she would lose her only friend. In the interview, she implied that this is why she might have done it, but there were so many inconsistencies between information from Vernon and Miss LaJoy that chopped and changed, it couldn't be used as a confession. She seemed very concerned about getting the $10,000 reward money and asked if she did do it, what would happen to her. When police said they didn't know, but suggested that she could be put in a mental institution, she started to clam up and suggested using that money to be put in a private hospital be better than her going into prison, as she needs too much treatment. It seems that she's trying to get Vernon put in jail without her paying the price. It's interesting to note that when her alimony ran out from the divorce to Vernon, that is when she decided to get in touch with the police. It could be that they did do this and she's only willing to give information up if she knows she can get away with it, along with the reward money. One source said it would be beneficial to the case if they had found the gun from the crime. It is very sad that 55 years later, still nobody has been convicted of this murder. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe and press the notification button for more videos.